Brethren, you may remember that the last time I spoke on Lord's Day evening, that I spoke from this very text. Now, this is not a rerun, by the way. This is enlargement of the things I could not pass over uh, or go much further beyond this text without visiting it again because it contains so much in it. Uh, I, I just uh, expanded it uh, one more sentence there, but I, but I had to go back to it again. Uh, it, it's, it's just so very large when we think about the things that God has revealed about himself that we might understand his ways that we might think like he thinks, that we might have his eyes and view things the way that he does, uh, because anything else, anything else is going to pass away. There's not going to be anything else except what he values and what he treasures. Uh, all the rest of it is just temporary. All of it is just window dressing, you might say. All of it is just part of the test and the circumstances of life that sift our hearts and and. If, we're, if we've received a love of the truth, then we'll be able to see through those things. We'll be able to assess and evaluate yeah. these things and make a righteous judgment, as the Master said, yeah. about these matters. Now, the word of the Lord, he is able. He is able and he is willing to speak to this cursed earth and to <laughs> this cursed race, <laughs> born of the flesh and given to the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The scripture record is a record of his words and his deeds to turn our hearts to these things that he loves, these things that he values, and not be deceived by the appearance of things. It is a self-revelation of God not simply, although it contains a listing of do's and don'ts, behavior and conduct on a human level, it is a self-revelation of himself that we might know him, that we might understand his ways and forsake our own ways. The Lord is pleased to make himself known that we might, as the Apostle Peter said, escape the corruption that's in the world and partake of his nature. That's the staggering thing. This is the good news, is that we can partake of his nature, that we can have eternal life, that we can know him and his son, Christ Jesus. Now, we're able to speak about these things. Isaiah's audience was not able to speak about these things like we can, with understanding and perception. We know the one whom the Spirit of Christ in these prophets was indicating. We know the one and the time now. These things have been made known and are clear to us. So, many are not able or willing. They're not able because they're not willing <laughs> to hear and see these things. Their minds are set on things on the earth. Their minds are focused on their own little lives, their own little circumstances. And uh, they, they may want some crumb. They may want some little tidbit off the table. But they don't want to sit at the feast as we said the other evening. They really don't want to eat the things that God provides for those uh, who have an appetite for righteousness. They really don't. They just want a little tidbit and then to go their own way back to the junk food of this earthly life. This is what the prophet says here at the beginning of this record. Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. And listen, listen, hearken to this. Give, a, give careful attention to these things that God has made known. Else, my goodness, if we don't have this revelation from on high, we're just adrift. We're just adrift in the, in the political and social and economic circumstances of life. And there's no anchor. There's no anchor. We see people all around us whose lives are just that way. They have absolutely no anchor for themselves. So hear, O heavens, and give, hear, o, give ear, O earth. Now remember, this is to God's people, this message. The Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider a last sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers. These are the Hebrew people, okay? Children who are corruptors. They have 
forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. They have not listened to what God has said about himself. And it confirms that there is this, this experience and the record of these things that we have confirms that there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who seeks after God. None. And yet we have this testimony, this strong testimony. Some have the attitude of, uh, well, some don't hear at all. They're like the pathway. The, the word can't even get in. It doesn't even register whatsoever. But then there are others who do hear, and they have this attitude. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. <laughs> He's not going to tell us what to do. He's not going to tell us. This was, the, this was the attitude of many toward our master, wasn't it? Who are you? Where do you get the authority to do these things? By who? Do you do these things? By whose name? See, And he continued to show them in all kinds of ways the authority by which he did those things, and they just rejected it out of hand. Yeah. No, he's an evil man. He's a wicked man. Well, do evil and wicked men do these things? He questioned them. If evil and wicked men do the things that I do, then Satan's kingdom's fallen. See? Amen. It wasn't logical at all, but they, they weren't interested in what was logical. They were interested in protecting their place and their ways, their own thoughts. God is not easily turned away in the purpose of his choice. He continues to press. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean, he says. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Learn, cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together. See, this, this message, this appeal to their behavior and conduct was not just an appeal to their behavior and conduct, wasn't it? Come, let us reason together. Think about these things. Think about what you're doing and what you're not doing. Think about these things. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. See, that from our perspective, that's the primary, that's the first order of business, is to be cleansed, to be changed, to have this indictment against us removed. It's got to be removed, or it really just doesn't matter what else you do. It doesn't matter at all. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So God has made these things known. See, there's no excuse. There's no excuse, as the apostle says. They are without excuse. And that's even those who didn't have this revelation. <laughs> this revelation raises the bar exceedingly. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. He will have mercy on him. To our God, he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as high as the heavens are higher, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. So this message then all of Scripture, or, or, or the, the overwhelming weight of Scripture is to those who have a heart for the truth, yeah. who love this truth. Amen. You can hardly point in it. There is no significant measure of this revelation that's given to those who, who are outside who have no hope and are without God. There is no significant amount. There's a tidbit. There is a tidbit here and there just so that men will know. Just so, like, like the revelation that was given to Nebuchadnezzar there when he was in graduate school. You remember out in the back, out in the field out there, without a haircut and without his fingernails trimmed. It was graduate school, see? And, and, and so he had, he had a report to write. He delivered that report to everyone about what he learned when he was out there. So it stood as a testimony, see? It stood at there is a God in heaven, and men will give account to God. 
and he's not messing around, if you want to say it that way. This is serious business. God takes it seriously. He takes it personal. Amen. Amen. And you violate him, and you'll answer to him. Amen. See? So, but then in the extension of this revelation to those who have heard these things and know these things, the Apostle Peter says judgment begins with the household of God. Now that makes it more serious, even more serious. Now who suffered more at the hands of the Lord than did Israel? Did Israel suffer more? I mean, did Egypt suffer more? I don't think so. Did Babylon suffer more? No, they didn't. It was Israel. It was the Hebrew people, God's own people, who suffered more. Even the Master talked about that there in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, when he gave this account of what would come upon the city of Jerusalem. Never before and never again will it be like this. In the terror of what they heard from the Lord, because they did not listen. So, Listen to me. Hearken to me, you who follow after righteousness. See, this is a message for those who've received the love of the truth. You seek the Lord. It's the same people who follow after righteousness, who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father. See, he tells us what he's talking about there in those figures of the rock and the hole of the pit. Look to Abraham. Your father, to Sarah, who bore you, for I called him alone. Notice he doesn't, he doesn't talk about what Abraham did, does he? He says it's God's call. It was my call that accomplished these things and that established Abraham as this solid, unshakable rock to which we can continue to go back again and again and again. There's only one Old Testament, per you remember, there's only one Old Testament personality who's mentioned more in the writings of the apostles and prophets than Abraham. It was Moses. And it's just one or two times. Just one, by way of contrast, they're, they're mentioned together so that we can see this. The Lord, the, the Spirit kind of juxtapos, juxtaposes them. Is that what that is? And, but this, for this contrast. So we'll see the, the, the truth. Abraham was living these things. Of course, we know the Apostle Paul tells us there from Galatians 3, we mentioned the other evening, that the covenant with Abraham was established before, before the law. The law was added to that because of transgression, right. see, because of the violation of God's will. And so in the, I, Isaiah is speaking in the context of that now, but he's appealing to these who have a tender and contrite heart. Remember Isaiah says twice, that's who I dwell with. The, the Lord said through Isaiah, I dwell with those with a contrite heart. In a high and holy place, yes, but also with those of a contrite heart in order to lift them up. Yeah. So that's what these words do. These words are to lift up the contrite heart, to strengthen them, to give them courage, to know that God will pardon. God will cleanse. You come to him, and he will receive you. So this phrase, hearken to me, listen to me, it's used three times in this section here in verses 1, 4, and 7. We're not going into 4 and 7 today, but, but it is mentioned again. So we, we know this, this is, these words are addressed directly and specifically. We're talking personally to you, see? This is right to you. Listen to this. Hearken to this. Which is a little, the word hearken is a little stronger than listen, isn't it? It, it involves really, really paying attention and, and, and letting that word uh, have an effect upon you. Letting it move you and direct you, of course, uh, this being not the words of men, but the words of God. It has power in it to do according to his will. It contains his spirit, if you will. It contains faith. It brings faith to us. And it also stirs up and provokes faith that... He has already implanted. See, for those who've already heard and received that love of the truth, hearing it again and again and again and again will nourish the soul and will strengthen and encourage and will provoke and stir up. If there's any fallow ground, it'll turn it up so that it can receive a light and moisture and, and, uh, and stir up the nourishment uh, that the word brings to it. There's nothing in us. There's nothing in us, you see. It all comes to us from him. And he's willing and able to supply it. 
So it's call, this is a call to involvement with the Most High. What he says, uh, what he's revealing about himself, what he's doing to have a people for himself, to, uh, to enable them and to, uh, to establish them. Now, we can speak about it this way because of this, uh, ex this exposition of the writings of the prophets by the apostles and prophets of the new covenant. How this has been opened up, and they could point back to it again. Well, this is that, and and, and we can we can see in their in their words, we can hear the echo of these hints that were dropped down through the generations. These little snapshot glimpses here and there of what God was going to do, and so forth. And the Apostle Paul will nail it down. Yeah. The Apostle Peter would nail it down, and especially Paul, of course. Content wise, is primarily from him. But they, they delivered these things to us, opened these things up, expounded them, made, it, made an exposition of the, an exposition is so you can see it. So you lay it out there on the table so you can see the thing. Makes it visible and clear to everyone then. Expound means to enlarge it. Make it, make it bigger so you can see more. So when heaven sends a message to men with a charge to listen and hear, boy, you rejected or neglected at your own peril. Mm -hmm. See? Think, of, uh, think of the contrast between Joseph Pharaoh and Moses Pharaoh. <laughs> Joseph Pharaoh listened. Mm -hmm. And think of the personal benefit. Yeah. Boy, for the next three or four generations, his nation grew in power and influence and wealth and power. Uh, a personal benefit, his own family personally benefited. And then Moses, Pharaoh, who is the Lord that I should obey him? And it was downhill from there on. Amen. I mean, he was caught in a, in a whirlpool. He was caught in a, in a windstorm from which there was no escape. And they saw his body on the shore of the Red Sea, yeah. likely. I, I can imagine that the Lord brought his body ashore for everybody to see. This is what happens yeah. for him who stands against the Lord. This is, this is where you end up, and that's just on the earth. Then he went to meet the Lord. Yeah. See, Then he went to meet the Lord. So, uh, Contrast, uh, I've already mentioned Nebuchadnezzar this morning. Contrast him and his grandson. He called him his son. He was actually his grandson. Nebuchadnezzar. And, and now me remember, Daniel mentions this. That Belshazzar, you knew these things about your father. Yeah. You knew this report. You read his report about what happened in the secret place in the back 40 for seven periods of time. You knew that, and yet you brought the vessels of God's house in here and drank wine from them, you and your wives and your servants, like they were common. This night, your kingdom is, you are judged, your kingdom is divided. You're found wanting, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians because he didn't listen. See? Think of Herod Agrippa the first. Now, this is the Herod Agrippa who had John be, or James beheaded. All the things that he saw and all the things that he knew that were taking place there in Jerusalem, the preaching of the gospel, and we don't know details of what he knew and so forth, but it was available. It was available. Herod Agrippa II had heard about these things, hadn't he? He wanted to hear more. I'd like to hear this man, he said. Hear about this Paul. I want to hear what he has to say. Well, Herod Agrippa I, he didn't care. He didn't care at all. And he got up and gave this speech, and the people acclaimed him divine, and he was glad to receive it for a little while. Yeah. But he didn't receive it very long, did he? He didn't glory in it very long. That man suffered in the body before, before he even went to see the Lord. He suffered a long time before he died for rejecting what he knew. So, so the, the form of rejection may vary. The form of reception may vary to some degree. We don't know what Joseph's Pharaoh 
knew beyond the revelation of this dream and so forth, but he had a lot of time. It's likely he had a lot of time to spend with Joseph. Huh? Worked together closely. Yeah, second to me only in the throne. Reporting to him regularly over that seven-year period of abundance. Well, we, we've gotten to the place where we can't count it anymore, sir. <laughs> well, everything that Joseph was said, had said was coming to pass, wasn't it? Everything, more than they ever ask or imagine. Yeah, who else was storing up, huh? Who else was prepared for what was coming? Amen. And then, of course, we get down to, well, let's say three and a half years during the famine time. <laughs> Boy, everybody was listening then. You think anybody challenged Joseph about anything by then? Not so. I just wonder how many times Pharaoh said, we better do what he says again. Haven't we learned? Haven't we learned? You'd like to know how many times that was said, huh? And yet, now, brethren, now we have we have these examples, but the, but this this message, this particular these particular words, are are not for those folk like that. They're for us. These these are for us who follow after righteousness and who seek the Lord, who've been stirred up and drawn. Yeah. No man can come to me unless the Father yeah. draws him. And he has drawn us. We're not ashamed to say that. We're not embarrassed to say that he has drawn us. <coughs> to whom else would we go? Where else would many of us, many of us, especially us older ones, we've, we've been a few other places. Okay? We've sought some, even religiously, we've sought some other things. And there was nothing there. We found out there was nothing there. We looked and looked and we trudged and we dug and we searched and there was nothing there. And brethren, I'm not just talking about our fellowship. Not at all. God forbid. We don't have a corner on the truth. This truth is in other places. Others have access to this truth. It just so happens that God has brought us together at this time and in this place. And we're glad. We're glad. We're not ashamed. We're not ashamed to say that we love the truth. We're not ashamed to say that we will accept nothing less. We've tasted of the less especially those of us who are older. We've tasted of the less. Uh -huh. We don't want it. We reject it. We reject it out of hand, wholeheartedly. And we see it from a distance. When we see it again, we recognize it from a distance. It's obvious to us. Now, it doesn't take a lot of examination. Okay? We follow after righteousness. And his is the only righteousness that is affirmed Amen. both by revelation and by our experience because that righteousness works in us. We, we personally know the benefits and effects of it. It's a wondrous thing. It's a precious treasure for which we have sold and continue to sell every other thing. Every once in a while somebody offers us a little something, you know, from here, there. No, no, no. Not, not going that way. Not going over there. Not wasting my time again. I've been there before. I recognize that. I know that. You're not fooling me. I've seen that before. I'm not going over there. So this message is for those of us who have an interest in things invisible. Things that, can, and I'm not ashamed to say this, things that cannot be detected by human reasoning, human intellect, academics that cannot be tested by some kind of earthly physical instrumentality. They can't be. No, they can't. And it doesn't bother me one whit at all. Right. There's all kinds of examples and illustrations in life of unseen things that men didn't believe a couple of generations ago. Yeah. And now they do. And you know what? They still don't have any physical evidence of it. They've done mathematical calculations. You can see these guys. You, you hear, you, you hear uh, reports and so forth and so on about mathematical calculations about planets that are 36 light years away. Well, how do they know? Who's been out there and come back and reported and brought a rock for us, huh? I want to see a rock from some of those planets. I'm not going to believe that stuff. Come on. Come on. We haven't seen that stuff. And yet they talk about it like it's just as plain as a salt shaker on your table there. Well, anybody can see that, can't they? Yeah, it's ludicrous, isn't it? It's just ludicrous. 
So you know, this is a as 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 they say in the academic world, this is a this is an ethical or a moral decision. It's what it comes down to. The folks who have much of a mind at all can see, if I go down this road, that's going to affect me in a way that I don't really want to be affected, you see? If I believe this about the righteousness of God and truly seek the Lord, that's going to affect, that's going to affect decisions that I make. Amen. That's, going to, that's going to make an impact on what I love and value and treasure and what I'll, what I'll pay attention to. And of course, when you pay attention, when you really pay attention to something, you pay a lot. Yeah. Not just attention. <laughs> you know, you pay your affection, you pay your time, you pay your money. Uh, you invest your life when you really pay attention to something. Amen. And those with much of a mind at all know that. At some point, they know that. They recognize that and see that. So, these words then are imbibed, we say. You know, they're, they're eaten and they're drank only, only by faith, which also comes with the words. It's good. It's, it's convenient for us. <laughs> but, but, of course, you have to yield yourself. You have to yield yourself. And people, people yield themselves. To, they always yield themselves to something, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. It, it may be political. It may be economic or social, may be on a personal level, but people always yield themselves to something. They may not admit it that way. They may not see it, that that's actually what they're doing. They don't want to say that because then, see, they'd be exposed. <laughs> Their motives would be exposed. They would be shown for what they really are, that they really just want this that feeds their flesh or their eyes or their pride. It would be shown for what it really is. When, when those who trust the promises of God, all those things are swept away. They're all swept away. The prophet says in another place, Behold, the former things have come to pass. New things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. And we're glad to believe what God has said about these things. Things that we can't examine with the, you know, feeling it or, or tasting it of the mouth or looking at it with the eyes. No, we can't, but we can look at it. In fact, we do look at things that do not now appear. We look at things that are invisible. That's what we do in our assemblies every time we meet. We're looking at things that you can't see, <laughs> except with the eyes of faith. And so that's why we want the eyes of our heart opened. That's one, we want that open so that we can, we can see them clearly. Remember ye not the former things, the prophet says, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. That makes me think of the Lord speaking to, to, to Nicodemus there. <laughs> Nicodemus, you got to get beyond these things that you think you know. Right. See? He came, Brother Gibbons, we were talking about personal revelation this morning back there in the kitchen. And then Jesus brought personal revelation, didn't he? We speak that which we've seen. We tell that which we've heard. Now, that's personal revelation, isn't it? <laughs> And here he was, speaking to Nicodemus, speaking to this preacher. I told the kids at Juvie this morning, I know something about preachers. Had somebody at, at work this week, after I spoke that morning, followed me in the popcorn room, and they said, are you a real preacher? Because if you aren't, you ought to be. <laughs> well, I know something about preachers, okay? And it's, it's a hard thing. Now, I've been in this position. It's a hard thing to have someone tell you things that all at once you realize, I should have known this a long time ago. Why didn't I see this? I have missed, I have missed the elephant in the room, so to speak. You know, we use that illustration. <laughs> this is the big thing. And I've been over here in the corner looking at this speck of dirt and the ant that's trying to move that speck of dirt. Yeah. See? It's an amazing thing when you think about it. What people do religiously and what they give themselves to, it's a staggering thing. It's just, ah, uh, ah. Uh. 
Again, the prophet says, Thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord. There's no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, Seek me in vain. I, the Lord. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. See, now that's why we want to speak about these things then. That's why we want to give our attention to these things, isn't it? <laughs> these things that the Lord speaks about. Not, not the understanding and the distillations of religious men down through the centuries. It's a, again, I, I'm, I'm just about to finish reading this book that I'd mentioned about the, it's just a little brief overview of the history of the popes down through the years from the very first one, of course, you know who they say that was. They don't have much to say about him. It was amazing. And, uh, and, and down to the most, uh, next to the last one here, and so forth. And it's just, it's painful. It's painful to read some of these things. Ridiculous. And yet you see it everywhere. When you start thinking about these things, you see it in every group. A lot of people would like to say, oh, yeah, those guys, we know how bad they were. Well, it's in every group. Come on. They're not willing to admit it. See, human religion takes the same forms. Uh -huh. It does. It just takes the same forms. It's not God's righteousness. It's our righteousness yeah. in one form or another. We like to dress ourselves up in our own fashion, religious fashion creations. Yeah. See? And make ourselves look good. How do you like this? How do, doesn't this look good? Don't I look good in this? See? And on and on it goes. And they love to admire one another. Oh, we don't want to criticize that. After all, that is their creation, and they have the right to have their own, you know, fashion creations and so forth. It's ridiculous, isn't it, when you think about it? But that's exactly what they do. I know. I know they do. I have seen it, and I still see it. <laughs> I had someone ask me the other day about going to one of these meetings that I haven't been to in several years. I said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. It's just a waste of time. I have important things to do. You know, I have to move boxes. <laughs> Let me tell you, compared to that kind of meeting, the things that I do in the warehouse on the fork truck are important things, stacking cardboard and things like that, you know. It really is. Amen. I'm telling you, because I know the, the uh, emptiness of what takes place at those things, the platitudes that are said, and the nothings that are spoken over and over and over again. It's a sad thing. It's a sad thing. So look to the rock, to Abraham, to the hole of the pit, to Sarah. Now, some might think that that is denigrating of our sister Sarah, but it isn't. You see, her body was empty, and it had no power in it, none whatsoever. It was, an, it was just empty. And she knew that, and Abraham knew that. And yet, they hoped against hope in the promise of God. They did not waver. Yes, amen. They, did not, they didn't understand, we know. But, hey, we've got a lot more than they did, and we haven't understood either, huh? How many times did we not understand? So woe to the person that criticizes them for their lack of understanding and their attempt you know, their attempt. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called. Now, this is, this is the Scripture interpreting the Scripture. This is the Holy Spirit telling us what he meant by recording those events back there in Genesis. Yeah. We know this text well. He was called to go out to the place. He would receive his inheritance, and he went, not knowing where he was called, where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promises in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. You remember, uh, Jacob was about 17 when Abraham died. He knew his grandfather. 16, 17 years old. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise. He waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. The hole of the pit, see? There was no strength in her. Her womb was as good as dead, the Apostle Paul says there in Romans 4. But she received strength when she was past age. She judged him faithful who had promised. 
So from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced. Fully convinced, fully convinced was Abraham that he, that what he promised, he also, he was also able to perform. Therefore, it was accounted to him as righteousness. And you know, that's a quote. <laughs> there in Romans 4 of Genesis 15, 6. It was accounted to him as righteousness. This was God's accounting. This was God's assessment of Abraham's faith. And the application for us, now it was written not for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us, to whom it shall be imputed, who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. You see, there's a personal connection there for us because of our personal connection to the seed of Abraham. If you belong to Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, Amen. the apostle said. Amen. So the Lord will comfort and he will make, he will make something out of nothing. That's us. <laughs> He's made us Amen. who were nothing into his own. The prophet Joel says the open pastures are springing up. The tree bears its fruit. The fig and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God. He's given you the former rain faithfully. That's the words of the prophets. The faithful rain that came down upon the land. He will cause the rain to come down on you, the former rain, the latter rain in the first month, the things that are spoken. Yeah, see? See how these things work? Yeah. He provides what, there, there's no hope. You, who's going to make it rain? No man's going to make it rain around here. Uh -huh. Not on us. We don't have the power to do that. We're not creating this, this nonsense about doing church. My goodness, you either are or you aren't. It doesn't make any difference what you do yeah. in that sense. Amen. Rethinking church. They ought to rethink he turns the rivers into a wilderness, says the prophet. The water springs into dry ground, so he can make it go either way. This is a text we just covered in our earlier Bible lesson a few weeks ago, one of the last lessons. Fruitful land into barrenness. For the, wicked of those, for the wickedness of those who dwell in it, he turns a wilderness into pools of water. See, for the wicked, he takes it all away. They have no resource. Not many folk talk about the Lord doing that, do they? They want to talk a whole lot about God giving this and giving that and pouring out this, and not many talk about God taking this away. Yeah. You, go, you, you seek to go someplace else, he'll just take it all away. You'll have nothing. Even what you thought you had, you will lose. Amen. See? That's right. Yeah. There he, he turns the wilderness into pools of water, dry land into water springs. There he makes the hungry dwell. Yeah. He makes the hungry dwell where he's going to supply for them that they may establish a city for a dwelling place, sow fields, plant vineyards, that they may yield a fruitful harvest. For you, O Lord. See, those who partake of these things recognize that you, O Lord, are good and ready to forgive, abundant in mercy to all who call upon you. You, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. See, those who seek the Lord who seek this righteousness, follow after righteousness, and who seek the Lord, they will, they will fully engage these good things that God provides for those who love him and are called according to the purpose. And this, and this is just the taste of it. This is just the beginning. This world, we're, we're not, we don't have the capacity right now to contain these things. The former the brother Robert was talking about it earlier this morning. We don't have the capacity right now. We're preparing ourselves. We're getting ready so that then we'll be able to contain 
and engage, fully engage these things. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He'll not always strive with us nor keep his anger forever. He's not dealt with us according to our sins. You know this text well. Punished us according to our iniquities. As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he's removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Rather than the further we go along, the more we see the truth, the reality of that, of where God has brought us from, the pit from which he dug us, the pit of emptiness, hopelessness, no power, nothing in there. There was nothing in there. But now because of the strength of the wisdom and the mercy and the kindness of God, that's been expressed in this person whom we know, in the Savior of our souls, in him who's walked among us, whose glory we've seen. And we see it because of the record of his life. We have the record of his life. We can believe these things and have life in his name because we believe these things. It's God who's provided this. This is the rock. This is the cornerstone that the Lord himself laid over which many stumble and are broken, fall and are, and are crushed because they refuse, they refuse to yield themselves to it. But those who do yield themselves, those who fall upon this stone willingly, gladly fall upon this stone, they are recovered. They are recovered. They listen and they look. And we continue to do that. That's not just, we know that's not just a one-time thing. We continue to listen and look. Even as we, even as we uh, nourish ourselves on, on the banqueting table of the Lord, on what he provides that we can feast at, he sets out this table, which, which includes this table, of course. But it's, it's, it's more than that as well. The nourishment that he provides, the bread of life, and the water of life, that we exchange one with another of these good things. This has already been mentioned this morning about, hey, this is some water that I found. Take a drink of this. <laughs> See, this is what we have when we meet together and encourage one another in these good and precious things. So, brethren, I exhort you then to listen and look these good things that God has provided for us. God's grace and peace to you, brethren. Brother Robert now has our exhortation. Thank you.